Howdy folks, Michael with the Reason RX Podcast. Hope you're doing all right. Today, we have, once again, the a guest, Scott Harris, or honorary co-host, if <laughs> I should say maybe, but um, we're going to be talking about modern education a little bit. Hope you've been having a good day. Um, things been going with you well, Scott? Yes. Cool. How was the coaching the, was it water polo yesterday? I, uh, yesterday I was refereeing high school water polo seven games. So it was a, a full day. Hmm. How are they? Um, of course, the athletes, given the sport, are not wearing a mask, I assume. What about other people in the auditorium and everything? Um, if they're on the bench, uh, they're, they're fairly spread out on the bench. Um, but then sp the spectators are also limited as far as number. Huh. And uh, they are generally wearing masks. So they're supposed to, but generally they are. And spread out. Yes. Yeah, I think that's what um, some relatives are doing, too. They have events, but only a certain number of people of each athlete are allowed to go. Um, right. And I know one, I think I mentioned this before, but one student I work with goes to an elite private school, um, cheerleader. Um, one of the coaches was found to have COVID, and so then none of, none of them, cheerleaders, football team, coaches, I think, couldn't go to school for like two weeks. Mm. That was like fall last year. Right. Yeah, a lot of stuff going on with that. It's like, what about the other sports at your school? Is Are all sports going or just some or what's the story? Um, most of them are back up in some form or fashion. Now it's uh, spring, so we're past football season and that kind of thing. Um, and it, kind of like pro sports, it's kind of odd in where they're playing on the court without a mask, but then when they get on the bench, they have to wear a mask. Hmm. Um, yeah. Volleyball, I think, played with masks hmm. uh, in the fall. Craziness. Wearing a mask while you're doing the sport is not a good idea. No. You need the breath. And you need to exhale the carbon dioxide and all that stuff. Cross country is training, and they're training obviously without masks. Yeah, good. But yeah, did you get out for a bike ride or anything this morning? Not this morning. Um, no, I was recovering from that full oh, day yeah. of, cool. of refereeing. Cool. What time did it start? What time did it end? Uh, we went from eight to four. Hmm. Are there any differences now versus how it used to be done pre-COVID? Uh, other than the limited crowd, that's that's the main difference. And then you are supposed to wear your mask when you're not. Obviously, when I'm refereeing the game, you take it off to be able to blow the whistle. How is this affecting um, student fitness, student health, student scholarships, playing? Um, sometimes some students do sports for their social activities. Some need to participate um, to get a scholarship, help fund college, whatever, or that's what they want to do in college to go try to go pro. You know how that's affecting some of the students there, or is that like well, on your radar? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the sports, pretty much any sport, if you're going to be really good at it, as far as wanting to earn scholarships, you're going to be involved with the club system as well. So swimmers train with the school in the morning, swim again club in the evening. And those kinds of things have largely still gone on under controlled circumstances. And obviously the colleges are aware. So I, I think it's still mostly happening. Cool. But I got out this morning. So I probably did a little bit for both of us. If I could like transfer some of it to you <laughs> i have i have been riding though i've been on cool. uh some 40 mile group rides recently and i've got a peloton now so i'm i'm riding during the week and i'm actually starting to get in decent shape so cool 
I did an interrupted run of about a mile because I'm going out, running, run, so I stop and walk, take some pictures. A lot of butterflies out this morning. Um, then I did a little foraging, pick some stuff along the side of the creek where it's legal, um, along roadways and waterways up to the bank on public property is legal. But I stay away from the roads because of the car exhaust, brake dust, stuff like that. Pesticides might be sprayed. Stay away from that. Along waterways, I'll go. But um, I got pick some stuff most every day for a green tea. Um, so it's fresh, fresh picked, a variety. Don't got to buy it. It's kind of free. Just takes knowledge. Because with some things, it's either... Um, it's not a matter of knowledge is power. It's like knowledge is life. Ignorance is death. Some stuff you pick. If you don't know any better, you could die. This is something where you better know yep. what you're doing. Um, but my tea currently, I got some Yupon Holly leaves. Yupon Holly. It's the only natural source of caffeine in Texas. Got some wild strawberries. Indian strawberries, as they're called. Um, strawberries themselves. Some leaves of them. Got some what's... Um, large flower or large pink sorrel um some flowers and some leaves it's kind of like clover um got some dewberry leaves it's related to blackberry got some pine needles it's supposed to have vitamin c in it but vitamin c's evaporates at about 70 degrees maybe so i'm not sure how much is actually in it you know i keep the top covered so maybe some of the vitamin c evaporates out but then falls back in and I don't know how much comes out of the pine needle in the first place. But I'm still getting some terpenes and other chemicals that I wouldn't normally get. Um, tastes good. And got some wild violet leaves. Um, hmm. Oh, and I got some, picked a bunch of mulberries the other day. So I got a few mulberries in there. You've had mulberries before? You heard of them? I've heard of them, but I have not had them. <laughs> When they, yeah, these were maybe a little less ripe. Maybe it's the tree, but they're good. But some others are a little sweeter. When they're sweet, they are delicious, just the best. But got some stuff like that going on with my tea. So um, picked some of that this morning. Got some good pictures of butterflies. Was that like hour, hour and a half too long? I wanted to be back before noon, but I got all carried away picking up some flood debris. Finally made it out like... A mile from the parking lot, went out in the woods, found a bunch of flood debris, maybe from Hurricane Harvey. <laughs> this big old trash can, like went on wheels, it had floated there. <laughs> found this like little plastic container and all this other stuff. So I filled up like in this one little area, hauled out that trash can, a car tire, some like tire from maybe a wheelbarrow or small cart. Um, then got some boards, some lumber, and got two 42-gallon trash bags, about two-thirds full. Hauled all that stuff out. Oh, and a mailbox. <laughs> the mailbox with the wood on it, you know, like an L shape. Yeah. And the mailbox on top of it. So you have done your good deed. Yeah. So it's good. Um, good exercise. Find the stuff. A lot of mobility work, bending over, picking it up, putting it in a bag, being very mindful and paying attention, you know, a lot of Montessori kind of thing, grasping that reason comes from the evidence of the senses, being very aware of the environment, drawing conclusions, seeing what the area looks like, um, identifying the trash there, having to be aware that there could be snakes that I need to see, you know, some people would just go out and like, because they're not used to it, they're used to like flat surfaces, they'd like go down the slope and they'd like slip and fall. I've even seen it. Or they don't pay attention to where they're stepping or there could be a snake there. But having been out in the woods for years, you know, it's just a switch like flips in my brain. It's automatic. I know what to do. How to move real slow through certain things. Because at the start, I don't know how many contact lenses I lost turning my head too fast and a leaf. Because I have like gas permeable, not soft. Turn my head, a leaf or a stick comes too close and just pushes the contact off my eye. And there go mine are like expensive. It's not like some people, ten bucks. Mine cost my vision so bad, it's like ninety bucks a lens. 
you know? I'd be happy if we could get people to develop situational awareness in grocery stores and realize that they're not the only people in there as they swing their carts around and crash into people. <laughs> yeah, their cell phones, yeah. But yeah, this has made me very situational aware. Um, way beyond what I ever was before. It's amazing. Ability to use peripheral vision, balance, control, all this stuff. Um, it's great. Besides that, you know, so there's a benefit of that. I'm cleaning up, making it better for myself, other people who enjoy the outdoors, the plants, the animals. It's good exercise. I mean, hell, you know. Re recently, I found a car tire. You know, the whole thing. It's like not just the tire, but the inner metal part, the wheel and mm -hmm. the tire. And the tire had water in it also. You know, carrying that, it's not light, you know. <laughs> right. So um, some stuff I'd have to carry like. One time I made four trips over 100 yards, 100, 150 yards, carrying this stuff. You know, carry some stuff like 100, 150 yards, put it down so the county can haul it away. Go back to, to where the stuff is, get more, haul it out. Um, good exercise. And plus, it's not like all flat and kind of mindless as it is in some gyms. You know, you got to watch where you're stepping again. Maybe snakes. You got to like wind your way through the woods move the stuff, move the tires, you're going through the trees and everything, the ground's a little uneven sometimes, and great stuff. But, oh, and then I got some biological stuff for a local naturalist. I know some naturalists at some parks, and I bring them samples for educational stuff, feathers and bones and skeletons and dead things, and recently some of them said, um, because, you know, they have, like, scouts and people, and they look at stuff under a microscope to learn to observe. Like, look at the feather. What kind of things can you say about it? And so she asked, um, uncertain if I did it. It's like, could you, it looked like she wasn't sure if she was going to ask at all. Like, could you, like, maybe, maybe, like, bring, like, some scat in, too? Yeah, sure, I see scat all the time. I'll bring in plenty of scat. I got so much scat. <laughs> I got coyote scat, I got bobcat scat, I got raccoon scat, I got otter scat, I got, um, what's it called, swamp rabbit scat, I got the scat, I'll bring you some scat. <laughs> That's a lot of scat you got there. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote her a poem today telling her I had some, maybe it would be, we can call it a poo haiku, although it's not actually a haiku, <laughs> I wrote her, <laughs> out in the woods I went. So most of my energy was spent, but I did manage to get for you a variety of animal poo. There, <laughs> genius, the best poem ever. Victor Hugo, you ain't got nothing on me. Okay, never mind. <laughs> but yeah, um, poem about the um, intelligence level of a fifth grader. I know, but that's all I'm capable of in terms of poetry. <laughs> but so yeah. Still a lot we can do, even though COVID's going on. We can get out, be healthy. Um, I'm putting Scott to sleep, so I guess we need to get onto something else. <laughs> He's starting to yawn. It was up late last night. <laughs> cool. Good excuse. But um, I haven't had breakfast since I was out too long. Maybe a little dehydrated. I had some water, but I'll be able to hang in there. But, um, so, yeah, that's how we're doing. Not that people cared or wanted to know, but there are some suggestions for things people can do to stay healthy, stay active, get outside, do something. Um, like I say, it's not just picking up trash. When I'm doing that, I am cleaning up, but, heck, it's like a labor of love for me. It's selfish. It helps the community. It helps people who care about it. I'm cleaning up the environment for the plants and animals that I love. Um... It's selfish. It matters to me. The animal, plants and animals matter. So in doing it for them, I'm doing it for myself also. And it's good exercise. I get fresh air, sunshine, exercise in a complex environment. I get to study nature, all this stuff at once. Where can you get that? You can't buy that anywhere. <laughs> but They don't sell that at the gym. Pardon? They don't sell that at the gym. Amen. But, okay, so today, um, 
we're going to unknowingly, Scott might not have known this, but what we're going to do is develop some points made by Martin Luther King Jr. And he went to Morehouse College, and in 1947, he wrote an article for the campus newspaper, The Maroon Tiger. Here's an excerpt from it. Um, open this up. Maybe I'll read more later, but um, open the light. Get back to my notes. So um, <clears throat> this article is entitled The Purpose of Education. Martin Luther King, 1947. He says, this is a paragraph I love and I agree with. Education must also train one for quick, resolute, and effective thinking. To think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We are prone to let our mental life become invaded by legions of half-truths, prejudices, and propaganda. At this point, I often wonder whether or not education is fulfilling its purpose. A great majority of the so-called educated people do not think logically and scientifically. Even the press, the classroom, the platform, and the pulpit, in many instances, do not give us objective and unbiased truths. To save man from the morass of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence, to discern the true from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction. Unquote. Amen, Martin Luther. Well, that reminds me, I was um, covering in psychology class, we were covering logical fallacies, informal fallacies. And we did a quick review of Plato's cave in which he argued that if uh, we imagine people who were born in the cave, lived their whole life there, and all they could see is shadows projected on the wall of real objects that are behind them, they're never knowing what those things really are. And so when King there repeatedly mentions propaganda, one can think of cable news or you know how difficult it is to get quality news these days. It is definitely propaganda and it is like those shadows on the wall. It's a distorted version of reality. And Plato argues, what if we could break uh, those chains, turn around and see the objects and even escape the cave? Those people would see things for what they really are, these people he would call philosophers. But what if we try to get back in the cave and tell those people that, hey, those shadows you see aren't reality, that nobody's Instagram life is really that good, that everybody's profile pic is 20% more attractive than they are in real life, right? These are forms of propaganda as well. And when we think about, um, again, whether it's finding quality news or even kids comparing their lives to online lives, it's shadows on the wall. So how do we root through that and, and get down to knowing reality? Mm -hmm. That's what they should be learning. But yeah, um, in Instagram, Facebook, news, um, and some high schools and colleges. It's just what some of the so-called teachers say is um, shadows on a wall. He even says here at the end, last paragraph, quote, if we are not careful, our colleges will produce a group of closed-minded, unscientific, illogical propagandists consumed with immoral acts. Be careful, brethren. Be careful, teachers, unquote. He knew back then, in the 40s, what would be happening 80 years later. Well, and all these are problems of human nature um, and, and largely of confirmation bias in which we seek evidence that supports what we already believe. And, you know, you think of, say, CNN versus Fox News and watchers of those channels love to make fun of each other for saying that the other one is fake news and doesn't understand it. And I'm standing back with Plato uh, saying you both are, right? That those are shadows on the wall and you really have do have to get multiple, multiple news sources 
to even get close to getting what actually happened. Um, the, it's no longer about conveying information as much as it's about controlling the narrative. And another good example of that would be the COVID wars, you know, with Trump versus Biden and watching people turn on a dime and accept the opposite opinion they had when their guy was in office or is out of office or whatever, mm -hmm. and all the while screaming science. And again, when you pull back and look at the process, there's nothing scientific about that kind of reasoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, science is about sticking to reality, not to um, slandering the other party. It's not social. Science is objective, not social. And, you know, the CDC... Uh, being held up as the temple from on high, you know, which uh, utterances are given and then we are all to live our lives. And how many times have they contradicted themselves? Again, when you pull back, you realize, yes, they're a medical um, bureau, but they're also a political one. Mm -hmm. And they do have to kind of sway in the breeze of the political winds a little bit. And that comes with good education, with knowing history. Um, what has the CDC said in the past? When have they been right? When have they been wrong? When have they been majorly right? When have they been majorly wrong? It doesn't magically become different nowadays. It's the same same thing. Well, and if, if you remember back a year and a half, um, initially any COVID testing was illegal, except for the one test that they had, which it turned out didn't work. <laughs> And I, I forget her name, but there was a, a, a woman doctor, I believe in Seattle, who started testing her patients anyway, in violation of federal law. And I thought, there's a civil rights hero. Are we really to wait until our government says you can test, you can cure, you can heal? Um, or do we need all hands on deck in a situation like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then that's what they did is started repealing their own regulations so that tests and vaccines and such could be manufactured. And then took credit for it instead of giving her credit. Well, and that's, you know, that's always the, the eternal question that, that economists ask is about optimality, that there's an optimal level of government regulation past which you actually create harm that wouldn't be there but for the too stringent regulations. And I think, you know, when COVID hit, that kind of put a giant reset. And everybody's saying, oh, well, we've never created vaccines this fast. And it's like, well, we could. Uh, but the regulatory approval process for the FDA for a new drug is something, averages something like 15 years. Mm -hmm. And Europe does it in half that time. Mm -hmm. uh, do European lives not matter? Uh, and then here they cranked out several vaccines within, uh, I think the Pfizer one they did within days. Hmm. Um, so one does wonder then what's the opportunity cost? What's the, the value we're missing of a more streamlined process? Maybe it's not days, but it's probably not 15 years either. Yeah, of course, you need to go through a scientific process, but as you said, um, political processes and scientific process are different. CDC isn't just magically all scientific. There's, um, as people will find out when they study more history, those who have studied a lot of history already know, not enough taught nowadays, but um, many, many situations where governments have gone wrong, um, like the Losenko affair in Soviet Russia. Um, Darwin was not regarded as um, being consistent with communism, and so it was rejected. Any Darwinian professor in biology was readed out, lost their job, all that stuff, or you had to go underground and, and deny it. Like I think they did to some extent, yeah, with the a lot of people know about the Fox experiment in Soviet Russia, um, looking at how domestication evolves in foxes. And that was Darwinian, but they had to come up with a way to lie about it 
and pretend it was something else, I think, to be able to continue um, and say, oh, this is really to see about how to farm foxes so we can have more fox fur for the glory of the Soviet Union. I think they had to lie about it like that instead of doing, instead of saying what they were really doing, which was studying evolution. But um, the Lysenko thing, like, they had to follow Lysenkoism in biology instead of Darwinism, and that just put Soviet biology behind decades. So I, I just lectured on Lysenko the oh, other day. Cool. Uh, last week was, uh, I think the 16th is uh, Holodomor uh, Remembrance Day. And that's the forced Ukrainian starvation of about two to three million Ukrainians under the Soviet Union. Lysenko was a believer in Lamarckian evolution. Right, so uh, Lamarck had this idea that the uh, the giraffes which stretch their necks the most, right, are going to get the more leaves, and thus they're going to pass on longer necks, right, to their um, to their offspring, and that of course is the opposite of uh, Mendel and Darwin and so on. But he was Stalin's man, and you had to believe in Lysenko. Um, Lysenko had this idea uh, that because some seeds are um, vernalization, that it, they don't bloom until they're exposed to cold, that we could do that to all seeds, not realizing that's a genetic difference in some seeds. So freezing seeds and this would somehow kind of inoculate them against the winter. And then guess what? Those seeds don't uh, bloom in the fall and you don't get wheat. Um, he had the idea that if you planted seeds closer together, <laughs> it's hard to say this without laughing, that because communism is all of us working together, <laughs> then these seeds would work together. And of course, what you're doing is making them compete for resources instead of spreading them out properly. Uh, Mao had a similar idea that because birds would sometimes eat seeds that we should plant them really deeply into the ground, like two feet. Uh, well, then of course, what's gonna happen is those seeds never see the light of day. So here is the approved science by the best scientist, stamped by the head politician. And if you disagree with it, you don't believe in science. And of course, by best science, to be clear for everyone, remember that's like pseudoscience, the best science according to what they say. And following the examples you gave about burying seeds two feet deep or freezing it, so it's the politically best science. Yeah. Right, and so now someone's gonna say, oh, you're comparing Fauci to Stalin or Mao, and I'm going to say, you don't understand how analogies work. The analogous part is, if you politicize science, you get bad results, regardless of if you're in a free society or in a bad society. And again, the Trump haters were certain he was politicizing science, and that shouldn't be, and then they're instantly certain that Biden won't, and vice versa. Um, the point is, you don't want the government to have. I'm, I'm for a separation of science and, and government, uh, just like for religion and for all the same reasons. And this is the approach that South Korea took. They had 24 some companies. Uh, their view is that science serves the people in general. And the government said to them, hey, we need this stuff quick. We need vaccines. We need." And their response was incredibly fast because they weren't encumbered with those prohibitions from the FDA and so on. And of course, some people might jump to conclusions, some people do, oh, you say get rid of the prohibition, so you mean use the vaccines regardless, and no, you mean test them scientifically, keep the science, keep proper rational testing, just eliminate some of the politicization, the bribing, the um, controlling of companies, besides, and we already have laws, it's not like if a vaccine causes a lot of death, there's no recourse or whatever. Well, and, and I'm sure we won't know for another year or two what the end result of all this is, but from yeah. the best that, that I think we can tell um, is that safety protocols were followed and things seem to have gone along really well, really quickly. And now Johnson & Johnson had the pause on their vaccine that, ju that just got lifted, I think, yesterday. Hmm. Um, so they are still taking safety precautions. And, you know, to your point, um, you think of the food pyramid, right, that the government stamped and certified, which I think it's 
pretty fair to blame much of the obesity epidemic on that. Mm -hmm. The dietitians argue that the four food group model we had from the 1950s is a better balance of nutrients than you know the the carbs and the grains and everything that were pushed on us in the 1990s. Yeah, and even before, it's explicit. Senator, what's his name? I forgot. In the 70s, is even on video on record. Some scientists are saying, "Mr. Senator, we don't we haven't gone through this and evaluated this claim that fats cause heart attacks." The senator says, "Well, well we're senators. We don't have the." time to like look through things and all the little i forgot he did call use some little pejorative term like y'all scientists gotta like <laughs> spend time you have all this convenience and you, need, you can have all this spare time to look at things we have to act we're real men we do things <laughs> because of that jerk that screwed there. up the diet for every american and made them experimental animals on this stuff it said what you think is irrelevant this isn't proven we're going to force a non-proven dietary regime on you. That's immoral. That's unethical. The guy should be like blackballed and sued and stuff like that. There's like there needs to be some like recourse and some feedback mechanism about things like that. That's well, like and again, unethical. why why is the government even involved in that? Yeah. Certainly, the American Council of Dietitians or whatever the trade group is um, can put out you know information on what types of food are our most nutritious and so on. Yeah. And so now we have a lot more chronic diseases in the culture. The rates are going up. More people are obese and overweight. It gets worse and worse. Um, and then... Well, now, uh, you know, now they're saying that butter is, is better to eat than margarine. And right, my whole life, they told us to eat margarine instead of butter. I went 30 years without the butter, you know, the good stuff. Yeah. Thankfully, I've learned about that a decade or more ago, so I've been eating butter and better stuff. Um, but um, some of this comes back from the 50s, too, because uh, even before some of this stuff was going on, there were already fitness and mobility problems in people. Um, harkens back to, like, the 50s. That's one thing that led to it, too. Um just some aspects of the culture. Um, some chairs, use of chairs, cars driving around. Um, certain doing so since people are more sedentary and not moving as human animals should, um, that's a big cause of some of this stuff too. Not, you know, because I mean, who the hell ever? Show me the person that developed chairs that sat down and thought, hmm, what's the best way to have this device so it fits human biomechanics and helps them have good posture and fits in with a good human life? None ever. All they do is say, hey, this little shape will work. It's easy to, like, form. I can cut this wood and sell it. And, hey, bam. Um, but, you know, and it's not to knock them as some people do. I mean, who the hell would think about it or who the hell would think you need to? It's with experience with looking at reality, then we can see, oh, we made this mistake. There's just things I didn't consider. That's the rational way to think about this. That's the only way. Assuming someone should be omniscient and know everything about how a chair should be designed is irrational because no one does. But that's basically what happened. They come up with a chair. They don't think about the totality of human life and what would be best. And then this stuff kind of accidentally happens. But because of stuff so, like that, even in the 50s, um, from what I heard from experts in fitness, the Army had to quit using the squat as a shooting position because people couldn't do it. But it's very efficient to, to shoot and squat, and then you, have, um, you decrease your silhouette, so it's harder to, right, for someone right. to get you. Squat down, you can get back up really fast and shoot. They, people couldn't, like a lot of them could not squat, so they had to quit doing that. But so what what modifications would you make uh, to a chair? Well, like to improve improve the chair as far as our life uh, lo lifelong fitness. It's a matter of not so much the chair as such, but how we use it. Just like houses also. Houses are fine. Damn right. I want my apartment. It's a matter of how you use it. People 
are indoors too much, so they don't get enough vitamin D and things like that, fresh air, and that causes health problems. Or it's a matter of how you use the chair. Um, oh, that you mentioned vitamin D. That that seems to be now the biggest predictor of the severity of what what happens if you catch COVID is your vitamin D level. Yeah, and some the people, people say that it is, and some people claim, well, it doesn't matter. But yeah, I think that's just saying it doesn't matter is just crazy talk. It's like it's just implausible. You know, the way knowing the causal mechanisms of how the body works, how vitamin D is relevant to the immune system, and so on, bone metabolism. To say it doesn't matter is just ludicrous to me. Plus, with the flu, one thing, well, when people have a weak immune system, people can die from the flu, but it's not the flu, it's the, um, what is it called, um, cytokine storm, and they kind of drown in their own mucus and stuff. That's the problem. If people had a healthy immune system, they could get the flu, they wouldn't have that cytokine storm, they'd be fine. But with a weak immune system, it doesn't know how to respond, and then you get the problem. It's not the flu, it's a bad immune system. Same thing here, you know. So that is relevant in this situation because we're talking about the immune system. You have an immune system. What does it take for it to be healthy? What do I need to do? What do I need to eat? What biological functions like sleep and exercise are related to it? Get that stuff dialed in. It'll work better. And then yeah, the severity will be decreased. So I think saying vitamin D is nothing is like beyond ludicrous. It's like illogical. Well, there, there's kind of a false dichotomy there that it's either everything or nothing. Let's let's say that it's not the mechanism by which uh, COVID is reduced. I would argue it's probably a marker of other behaviors, that if we're mm -hmm. low in vitamin D, as you said, it's a lot of indoor living, et cetera. And then with COVID and you throw in lockdowns, you increase right, the, the rate in which you're around other people who arguably could have it instead of being sure. out and getting fresh air. Yeah. So it may just be a marker for other factors that contribute. And then it's not like some things in physics or chemistry where you can just look at this one thing. Vitamin D cannot be looked at in isolation because there's cofactors it needs to work. Um, vitamin D to work well requires some vitamin A, some vitamin K, two, some magnesium, some zinc, some other cofactors like that. Um, so you can't just say vitamin D or not. It's this rich, holistic, biological context that is to be taken into account. Um, is the zinc level right? Do you have enough vitamin A, vitamin K, all this other stuff? How's that? All right. So, um, and then, yeah, like how much sleep are you getting? Things like that. Um, well, and then you extend that into urban design, right? And there's a lot of emphasis right now about our cities walkable. Mm -hmm. um, and then you think about when we grew up, it was you got in the car and you went to the mall. Um, and now they're starting to build what are called five plus one. So first level shops, right? And then apartments above it to where you could actually enjoy a better part of your day without needing a car. You could go get coffee, you could go get a bagel, um, walk to shops and so on. And so that's kind of making a renaissance in urban design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they're finding out the need for um, sunshine, getting more sun inside, changing the design. Um, something we gotta learn, get outdoors more, um, get more sunshine in, um, and then in, in regards to the chair, you know, I mean, I have chairs, but it's a matter of having ones of different height and making sure you sit down on the floor sometimes too. And I'll sit down on the floor and watch TV. Um, that's one thing kind of like, um, with the vitamin D being kind of like a marker for if like the severity of COVID that you have and the probability of death, you know, the higher the COVID, it's an inverse relationship, the higher the vitamin D, the less likely you'll die. The higher the vitamin D, um, the l lower severity you'll have. But remember, you got to put that in context of like, as I say, these other things, you can't just look at vitamin D alone because we're biological organisms. We're holistic and complicated and there's a lot of feedback stuff going on. But with, um, what was I just talking about? 
with the vitamin D, there's something else that's kind of like that too. And I forgot what I said because I'm kind of tired and I should have read it down. But <laughs> there's a relationship. Okay. There's genius there. Um, maybe it was the chairs. It's like, um, oh yeah, the thing with the floor sitting. So kind of like that with the vitamin D. Um, with it's like a marker and you can't just look at it in isolation, but there's also, it's been found a relationship between quality of life and how long you live, depending on how many limbs you need to get off, off the floor. If you can get up with one limb, then that's a marker that you're going to, you're healthier and you're going to live longer. If you need to have all four and you like uh, have to work your way up or you can't get up at all, then that's a marker for being weaker and not having a good, strong biological system that's adaptive and resilient and it will live longer. It's not, of course, like a magic thing. No one's saying that unless they're like unscientific and illogical. People say a lot of things, so I won't put it past them, but no one rational is saying that. They're just saying it's a like marker. Um, so if you get on the floor some, it'll help also. Chairs a different thing, um, heights, do some stand up. Kids should have the option at schools to be able to sit down or sit on a ball or stand up at a desk. You know, it should like be um, modifiable so they can lift it up more. And it used to be better. I've even seen some videos on YouTube. You can see where the desks were adjustable and they would adjust the seat and the desktop in the angle for the student. Can you do that now? No. Your humanity is irrelevant. You have to fit the furniture. The furniture doesn't fit you as it should. So human beings are not used to the standard for a value. And you know, it's like how a human is, no one cares. You've got to fit the furniture. That is not logical. That needs to change. And desks in schools really must have been designed for elementary to early middle school kids because even a normal size high school student that sits in them or let alone when adults sit in them, they, they're getting pretty close to airplane seats, you know, yeah. where they're Ugh. just three quarters of the size they should be. Yeah. Um, and they're flat. They're parallel to the ground. I think they should be at like a 15, 20 degree angle. People used to know that. It's interesting. Yeah. Like again, how when you study history, you see it's not an upward linear progressive improving trend. It goes all over the place. Um, sometimes it gets better. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were in more recent history, but that sure the hell isn't an improvement. And there are some things that are good in history and that are lost, like some ideas about fitness, um, or look at what happened with, um, Aristotle's thought, Archimedes, Apollonius, Aristarchus, all this great thought that had been done was lost from Europe for hundreds of years, like 1400 or so, and had to be reintroduced by the Arabs back to European society um, to improve. Um, and even then, even though Galileo and Newton learned from Aristotle, um, nowadays you got these people who are irrationalist again. It's kind of going backwards. Some people obviously still know Aristotle's thought, otherwise I wouldn't, but it's not as prevalent as it could be and should be. We're definitely in a post-rational <laughs> world right now. Yeah. But, um, but then, so some stuff's lost. Same thing like with being on the floor. We need to get back to doing some of that, be able to get to different levels, be able to get up and down for the mobility and strength. Um, hip mobility is very important and it's compromised in a lot of people. Um, and I know because I'm a certified fitness trainer and I've studied this stuff, I've looked into it. Not that I know everything, of course. I'm not omniscient. I know what I know. I don't know what I don't know. Um, but you can look into it. Um, look up some of the stuff I said. But yeah, so it's diet and lack of mobility and movement that's caused some of the health crises we have now. Um, 
And I think people would be better off too. COVID wouldn't be such a big thing if people were healthier. To what extent? I have no idea. It's impossible to run an experiment in America with good diet, get sunshine and exercises, and one that doesn't. I mean, not possible unless we kind of like segregate certain groups of people. I guess we could kind of like are kind of running an experiment. We could like, but I don't think anybody like looks at those people. You know. But um, does that answer your question about the chairs? Uh, somewhat, yeah. Somewhat, yeah. Yeah. Sit on the floor, get a use a chair. Some like, did it, was there something you were thinking that I didn't address, or what? Oh, and um, you know, to your point, a, a fair number of teachers have gotten standing desks this year. Oh, cool. Because initially, uh, a lot of us were teaching online, and you're in a chair for eight hours you know, teaching online. Now I've got a little um, iPad, a little robot thing that holds an iPad and films me and the microphone I wear around my neck and it tracks that microphone. So no matter where I move in the room, the camera cool. will film me and, and I'm on my feet. And interestingly, I asked the kids when I first got it, I said, which do you like better, me sitting or on your feet? And they said, oh, definitely on your feet. Hmm. And they said, they said my lectures were better when I was on my feet. And... Uh, you know, Aristotle would be proud of that, being peripatetic, walking around, talking, thinking. And I, I really do think better on my feet, I think, than, than sitting. Yeah, I think that's just a story made up. I don't think, from what I've read, I'd have to look into it more. No one around Aristotle's time ever said that he would walk around like that and talk. You know, I'm sure they would, but just the idea of it nowadays, I think some of that came only a few hundred years later with some of the biographies. Um, so that's kind of like Archimedes running through the streets yelling Eureka. I think that was a myth. No one ever said that at his time. That only was written it's like a later. Good story. Yeah. It's a good story. <laughs> it was a different time, too. It's like him supposedly running naked through the streets would be more normal because the Greek athletes um, in the Olympics, they would compete naked. It was like um, that's just the way things were. Or what? Doesn't a gymnasium originally mean like naked exercise or something like that? I'm not sure of that etymology. But um, I thought that's what I had seen before. Maybe I'm remembering wrong, but I think so. But it was different. But um, anyway, in terms of thinking and walking, yeah, Steve Jobs would do a lot of meetings that way, go on long walks, talk about things. And it, I, I think one of the benefits of the walking is not just the physical movement, but it's the time that it buys for reflection. <laughs> and, and too often, certainly with schooling, we think of thinking as something to be accomplished by the end of this worksheet. And, you know, neatly done in 45 minutes, and we, we call that learning, when in reality, learning is stretched linearly over time as, you know, it's kind of like reading a good novel over a couple of weeks or even months is that you change, you reflect, you maybe even reread a favorite passage and you can feel yourself changing over time as you integrate and absorb that novel into who you are and then scenes of that you keep for the rest of your life. Um, I, I think if we had more of, you know, kind of like the slow food movement, slow learning movement in which we stretched assignments out and, and revisited and keep integrating other things with that instead of these neatly consumable things that we can do in a class period. And that's looking at that'd be an epistemological difference. I think some of this nowadays is too um, maybe too platonic, got some other influence there. Whereas what you're saying would be more multidisciplinary, um, would involve more integration. Um, One example, um, in my philosophy class, we are doing a paper right now um, called Syntopicons. I've I've brought these up before on this podcast. But they have a choice of uh, three topics, and our last set is democracy, tyranny, and liberty. So of those three, they're going to pick one, and then they're going to produce a one-page typed paper on that topic. And it can be persuasive, informative. They've got freedom to write however they want. But that's a very abstract concept that they're then going to say something significant about in only one typed page. That's not done in 45 minutes. That's done 
with a half hour of me talking about the three of these topics to kind of give them something to work with and then them spending another half hour at least to even get a solid thesis down right after they've done their brainstorming and so on and then we refine it from there so that stretches over a week or two yeah and then to write a good paper um speaking of which it's kind of the same thing with essays to sometimes people go through a few drafts but usually you write an essay, turn it in, that's it. Shouldn't be that way. You should go through like three to five, seven revisions with the teacher. That's when you learn how to think. It's not just you're learning how to write, you're learning how to think. Because you can't put words on paper unless you have thoughts to express. And with that and time, they write something, you point things out to them they hadn't thought of, or you say, okay, look, I know you're BSing. I know this isn't serious. All you did is went to slop slop stuff down here. I'm not stupid. I did that before. I'm a teacher. I've seen a lot of people do that. This is BS. Okay? I'm calling it what it is. Please, you can do better. Take this serious. Take your mind serious. Rewrite this and turn it back in. Things like that. And I think one mistake we've made is teachers expect that kids are going to do those three to five rounds of editing, and they're not. They don't um, know. Yeah. In in part, a they either don't know how or they're not passionate enough about the topic to really spend the time, again, thinking, reflecting, and so on. So I've been doing this type of writing assignment for 30 years, and what I've realized over the years is you have to reverse the process and bake the editing into it on the front end so that when it is turned in, they have done those three to five rounds. And so I work with each kid they're not allowed to write until I approve their thesis. And that's the hardest part for many of them is they don't know what to say. And how do I come up with what I want to say about democracy or tyranny or whatever? And so we teach them how to do a word web and kind of pull out ideas that are interesting to them. And then once they have a thesis, it's amazing. All of a sudden, they're great writers, or at least they can they can produce something that supports what they want to say. Cool. And then we do another round or two of polish, and then they do a self-evaluation rubric in which they, instead of me, are comparing their work to here's what good writing looks like, does your match up? So by the time they turn them into me, um, really, they're, they're typically A papers. Cool. Yeah, and then it sounds like they're learning... Um the principle that before you say anything, you have to know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> yes. How do I there's... say what I want to say? And then this, is, this is the beauty of writing. Um, and I forget whose quote this is. He's, he was a writer, said something like that. How do I know what I want to say until I write it? Like you have to do pre-writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, they internalize that process and you can start doing that without writing. Um, you can start... Right, ideas that you've been thinking about and you heard this quote and that scene from a movie and you're kind of putting together. And then one day you sit down to write a paper. Well, you've got that kind of outline already in your head and it becomes much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so but again, you that, you know, that compared to doing the little worksheet that we can get done and turned in by the end of the period, it, it's hard to develop thinking mm -hmm. that quickly. To some extent, not possible because it takes more reflection, feedback. And, you know, there's value in worksheets for conveying information or practicing problem sets and so on. Yeah. But it, it's also very easy for teachers to fall into that comfortable rhythm, right? Because there's a product and we're checking the boxes and I can give you grades. Um, but when we're arguing about what tyranny is or democracy, it, it's not neat and clean boxes. Yeah. Um, yeah, some math, some physics, some things like that. Some history, just knowing some facts. You need to do some worksheets. Um, some of the drill. Um, I remember when I was getting my Texas teacher credentials, how you got these people that are all proud of themselves that would call it drill and kill. We need to like help them be creative and learn to think. No drill and kill. Well, if they don't know any facts, how the hell can they do anything? And what? Yeah. It's like it's like hello. Have some common sense. What does a sports team do? You can't say, oh, we're going to be 
the best football team and win the Super Bowl. And to be good, we're not going to drill, drill and kill. We're just going to work on our creativity. Not, or do you want to go to a band to do that? Like, you want to go see some rock band. You want them to practice and train so they can get up there and perform even when they do their rock band drug drunk stuff. They need to, like, be able to perform. And all they're going to, the only way they do that is if they drill. You don't, you know, I wouldn't want to go see, like, an orchestra that hadn't practiced. Um, oh, we've never worked together, and we don't know this piece of music, and we're just going to go play. Not, you know, drill, drill, drill. It's important for martial arts, music, performances, sports. Learning is a skill oh. also. Your mouth, you need to drill. You think about athletic teams, you know, especially at the elite level, breaking down game film down to the smallest parts. And when I teach them to write these syntopicons, the first we spend on the first one, two weeks of class to write this first paper. And it is a ridiculously long amount of time uh, to break down. Right. But we we do get into the nuts and bolts of writing. And yes, they should have learned all that in their English classes, but I can't presume that. Um, but at least they're exposed to it and they see the rubrics and I have a, about a 30 page writing guide that I've cobbled together from, you know, just tips and quotes from various writers. And this is what good writing looks like and so on. And so, yeah, we spent a lot of time, but that first paper comes out pretty decent. And then as they internalize those things, as we go through the successive ones, um, even, you know, by the end of the semester, they end up being pretty good writers. Sweet. Nice. Um, and that can be used in all areas. I've used it in physics, biology, getting people to write things, then going through a bunch of rewrites. Um, it helps. Well, and, and you know, the quote unquote good writers, the kids who are in GT English gifted and they've made nothing but A's, those are sometimes the worst papers. Yeah. Because they just have so much to say and they have three things in the first paragraph that each could be a thesis. They're using every $10 word they've ever learned. And you know, it's like, oh, this is not good writing. And they're like, but I always get A's. I'm like, you shouldn't have. <laughs> True. Yeah, I know. I've seen that like helping people on the SAT back when the SA was required for the current 1600 right. one, when it was like 2400 or even before then. There are people who say, oh, I just want help with the math. I don't need help with the English. I'm like, I'm a good writer. Um, but <laughs> they do what like, fiction stuff and they they get their and i say you need help on the writing and they won't listen of course so i don't say anything then they get their score back and out of a 12 they get like a six and then they're like looking at me with this little pitiful dog face I'm like well, what happened i'm such a good writer <laughs> yeah right okay <laughs> let's just work on the math <laughs> yeah i tried but i'm not gonna go there but um it's a totally different kind of writing and you got to know how to write really well and effectively and logically, and not just like make junk up. But um, it's sad. But, um, oh, one thing before I forget about the, what, did you want to say anything more about the writing and the longer, taking the longer to educate some things instead of just doing worksheets on everything? Did you want to develop that topic more? No, I think I think we made the main points. Cool. But with the walking um, versus sitting, some things to consider. I think uh, more parts of the brain are activated when you're walking. You're awake more. Sitting is more like lying down or and therefore sleeping. I think parts of the brain shut down. Um, I think it comes up in brain scans too. When someone's standing up and moving around, more parts of the brain are firing. When they're sitting down, more of it's like less is firing, more is turned off. Um. When I think it's, um, you know, having a mix. If, if we're a bunch of adults in a room and we're working on a project, probably we do get up and walk around a little bit as we think and talk and so on. But, you know, for 100 years, it's been 30 chairs in square rows. Um, which has its uses. Uh, I'm a square row guy, but I'm also for let's put them in a circle or let's do clusters of four and talk with your neighbors and yes, sit on the desk, walk around the room, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, and then there's your blood chemistry is different when you're standing up too. 
brain's firing more. Um, when you're sitting down, you know, like your glutes and some supporting muscles deactivate. When you're standing up, your glutes got to fire. Um, when people are sitting down, when they have flat desks, they'll have bad posture. When you're standing up, you can have better posture. Um, using a little more energy, using more muscles, um, brain's got to control them. So there's a whole hell of a lot going on and a lot that people didn't even know yet. Science didn't even discover. Well, I've, um, I was happy to get that camera that follows me because um, for the first time in my career, I was sitting for the better part of the day. I mean, I've, I'm on my feet, you know, 90% of the time I'm at work and I kind of like it. And yeah, you're tired by the end of the day, but I didn't know you could get tired from sitting in a chair. That, you know, <laughs> yeah. Certain you're in a chair that long and certain muscles in your legs. Like when you stand up, you feel like you need to stretch them out. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All that deactivation, de-use, de probably some degeneration, ligaments and tendons as well. But are you still doing everything at home or are you like teaching in the school too? No, um, this past fall, we came back in person as teachers. The students, however, could choose whether they wanted to come back or do at home. Now, I teach mostly uh, juniors and seniors, and they have mostly stayed home, uh, whereas the freshmen and sophomores have mostly come back. <laughs> And basically, look, if you're 17 and 18 and you can stay home and, and do class on your bed and have the refrigerator right there with snacks, I mean, come <laughs> on. Yeah. So I only have between one and three kids in my class hmm. um, and then the rest are online. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And they can sleep more, too. That's a good thing about staying home. They can actually sleep like they should for a change. Well, I, I read a, a study the other day in which they were talking about, you know, the, the moral panic of um, kids being online and, and social media causing more depression. What they're thinking now is that depression is tied mostly to sleep because when COVID hit, what you just said, kids don't have to necessarily get up and shower and get dressed and do all this stuff. They can just kind of get up and go online and that they're getting significantly more sleep and they're seeing depression rates go down as a result. Huh, cool. Yeah, so... Now, now the, the, the flip side of that is we have seen some kids um, have depression-related issues that did not have them pre-COVID. And I've had a, a one or two be hospitalized this year. So, several others have developed uh, severe anxiety and depression and you know part of it is come back to school yeah. being at home works great for some kids and for some kids it has taken them from being a b students to just losing all motivation and mm -hmm. yeah yeah we're not like ants but we are social animals self-sovereign social animals but um oh one thing about the chairs too one thing to do is to move around and sit in all different positions, not just one. I remember that when you said some people sitting on top of the, the desk. Yeah. Don't just sit there like an Egyptian statue. Move around. Yeah. Use the chair. <laughs> kick, put, you know, put, cross one leg. Like one left leg might be foot resting on the floor. And then the right leg you can cross and put on the chair under the left leg. Then switch it. Then have one like kind of like you're half sitting, have your knee up against your chest and one leg on the floor, just move around in all kinds of different ways. Um, I think that's more the thing, like a problem people used to have with so-called standing in some factories was just standing there, not moving. Standing is not a problem as such. Sitting is not a problem as such. It's just how you do it. And you got to make sure you don't hold one position too long. Like if I stood here like an Egyptian statue the whole time we're talking, that'd be bad too. Just like sitting too much and notice, you know, when I'm deer, I'm like rocking back and forth on my feet, left and right, forward and backward. I need to get more of a habit of like, I always forget. I know I should like stand on one leg and balance, but I always forget. But I need to do that more. Get a kettlebell over here and hold it some. And But all kinds of things you could do. Um, 
Some people use treadmills too. Get a treadmill going real slow while they're working. Well, that's why I was reading an article by a doctor in which he was talking about ankle mobility being one of the first things to go in old age, <laughs> just as far as, you know, we worry about old people falling. And so you've maybe even seen those things on TV now where they're trying to get seniors to get comfortable with um, non-level surfaces, right? And build some, uh, or, or at least maintain that ankle dexterity and sense of balance. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that's kind of sad. People don't think about. I used to not either for a long time until I learned from people smarter than me. But yeah, people don't think about, oh, snap, I need to take care of my feet. Like they're the base for everything. They go around, get lost in comfort, wearing their shoes all the time, tune out, never think about it. But it's like putting your feet in a coffin, you're destroying them. Shoes are good for some things, you know. Like I, want, I don't wear shoes so much, but I wear sandals at the gas station. No way in hell I'm walking on, you know, <laughs> all that oil and gas and spit. No telling what's on that, you know, a <laughs> gas station or in a public restroom. No way in hell I'm going in barefoot. But, um, or, you know, like some police work where you got broken glass or some EMS. Hell yeah, you know, they need shoes. But um, people get all like, get all weird about shoes and have some kind of fetish and they're wearing them all the time and like, they need to like let their feet be feet, not flippers. You know, when they're <laughs> too much, the, sh the foot can't do anything. It degenerates. All these muscles and ligaments and tendons and all these nerve fibers kind of tune down or degenerate. And it's like controlled. And all it can do is like this. Like, I'm, so people can see, I'm just keeping my fingers and thumb all stiff and all straight and just waving it around like a flipper. The toes and everything need to move. It needs to like feel the ground and adjust and adapt and be flexible and mold. Um, and you need to learn to accept feedback from the feet. In shoes too much, a lot of the feedback, neural feedback is just cut off. Um, they're in little coffins. Um, people need to have <laughs> be barefoot some so they're used to getting that neural feedback from their feet. There's a lot of information there. I think our feet have, like the bottom of the feet are one of the areas in the bottom, in the body where neural density is greatest. And I think that's why using like using the feet as a form of torture has been done through um, human history. One thing I've heard they do is like get some rod and just like slap people's feet. Mm -hmm. um, all the nerve density, it's just like major torture. Um, but the nerves are there for a reason, you know, biologically. We need the feedback, and yeah your mobility, the total use. Um, but think about, uh, for people that, you know, out there, if you haven't, think about the whole holistic context, the mobility, the muscle, the ligament, the tendon, the neural feedback. When people do exercise or gym stuff, too many people are focused on the muscle or on calories, and they're not thinking about other stuff that matters, ligaments, tendons, bones, skeletal structure, biomechanics, neural feedback. What about your brain? Okay, you're you're run, you're doing something to run for your cardiovascular system. What about your brain? What have you done for your brain today? You know, what have you done for your neural system today? That's what they make podcasts for, so you can <laughs> yeah. and learn while you exercise. Right, you can just lie down on a sofa on your back and listen to a podcast. My brain's being worked. Well, if I'm on a you know two hour bike ride, let me tell you, podcasts are are great for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For stuff I do, like when I'm driving around, everyday stuff, I listen to stuff a lot. But then, out in the woods, everything's off. Um, I want that brain reset. Focus on what comes to me. Um, what's in nature train myself to listen to the sounds out there and be aware of my surroundings um things like that but yeah but um so yeah so we've like really gone wide and broad and deep about being a human in this COVID thing sitting well and vitamin D to 
yeah, to maybe bring it full circle then is what does it look like post COVID? Let's assume for the sake of the argument that after this summer, um, numbers are really low, pretty much nationwide, vaccines are up and we start returning to life, uh, you know, as we did prior, what parts of this do we keep? Do we still have hybrid schools in which some students can stay home or even online high schools for kids who want that? Um, do we still wear masks, as I saw proposed every winter, because think of what we could do for the flu? Um, oh, yeah. So do, does it go back to normal or do we carry forward some of these adaptations? If we, if everybody wore like scuba suits with like a tank on their back, <laughs> like, <laughs> like multi-system ventilation, man, just think what we could prevent. Yeah, I will not be wearing a mask in the fall. <laughs> what? I will not be wearing a mask in the fall, so I sure hope that's what my school's rules are in the fall. Yeah. Um, I was willing to do it, but we're, we're three semesters in. Yeah. Um, but, oh, and one thing, let me touch on this quickly, too. We were talking about when I said, what have you done for your brain today? If people get out and do complex activities, gymnastics, karate, martial arts, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about, or moving in a complex environment. Because um, it's different moving in a complex environment than martial arts and gymnastics, where you just kind of make yourself do stuff. That's good, no doubt, we need it. But if you get out on uneven surfaces in a complex environment, um, out in the woods. You got logs, you got to step over, you got to look where you're doing. You can't just walk straight and be mindless. That is very good brain activity. Um, I mean, that's why you dig into the roots of things. Why the hell did consciousness evolve? It didn't evolve so we could like listen to podcasts, even though we do. I recommend it. Podcasts are awesome. I've learned a lot. I recommend listening to good podcasts, not wasting our time, but consciousness evolved to move around in our environment. And reason is an adaptation of that. It's not some separate platonic thing, some ivory tower, little bobble, um, some little plaything. Reason is a development of consciousness for the purpose of survival, basically moving through our environment. And for us, it includes like moving socially at an abstract level. Um, a lot of stuff is turned on. And you get the whole mind, perception, brain, neurological system, muscle integration that you can't have when you're just sitting there thinking or reading. It's not that I'm not recommending that. I do that sometimes. I just sit there and I read or write because it's hard to go outside and try to write something when it's like 100 degrees in a hot Houston summer and you're walking along to the woods, I don't recommend that for writing. Not going to work. I need an air-conditioned place where I'm not going to sweat all over the paper, and the paper's going to tear when I write on it. I need paper to stay paper, not become wet. And you need some concentration, but we need this variety. Um, so... Some stuff at parks too. Walk over picnic tables, crawl around under them, do all kinds of different movements, whatever's a challenge. If it feels uncomfortable, um, it's probably a good thing because then you're challenging yourself. As we talked about before, the four stages of learning unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, unconscious competence. In other words, first we're stupid and we don't know it. Then someone points out to us how we can't do it or we don't know it, and then, oh, then at least for most people, they learn instead of lie about it, and then it becomes second nature. Um, same thing. If it's uncomfortable, that means you're challenging yourself. That means as long as you're following biomechanics, being rational, following the laws of the world, if it's uncomfortable and you do that, then you're improving yourself. Um, whereas, yeah, you know, if you put a tack 
for like five tacks in a chair and sit on them, that's going to be uncomfortable, but I don't recommend it. That's not the discomfort I'm talking about. But um, things like that um, would help. Or, as you know, you know, it's probably, Scott, if you're, when you bicycle on a concrete road, it's pretty kind of comfortable and easy. And you get your mountain bike and you go out on a bumpy trail, it can be pretty uncomfortable, but it's challenging. You know everything's working. You got to think. You got to make sure you're not running into a rock. You got to look around. You got to fight for balance more. There's a lot more muscle movement and everything. It's like your total self is coming into play. It's like that kind of discomfort um, is beneficial. Yep. Scott says, Amen, brother! <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, so, um, did you want to discuss some of these high schools and some stuff that's happening during COVID that we had discussed before the podcast, some of the links we shared, or not? We can, or that could be a whole other Whole, whole podcast in itself. Yeah, maybe we could do that. Either way. Um, yeah, no, maybe since we talked about this stuff, kind of different topics. Yeah, why don't we, well, let's, let's at least give them a teaser of what we were talking about. So we're yeah, talking about... I can just wait and find out. <laughs> Unless you want to, whatever you want to do. Then next time, okay, that's fine. But no sense getting all like started on it. But... Yeah. We can better prepare. Yeah. But, um, so, um, how would you sum up this conversation, Scott? Well, um, we've covered a lot of stuff from, you know, physical movement to human interaction. Um, I, I still think there's no substitute for real people sitting in the same room discussing ideas and, yeah. and that kind of thing. So we'll see how much of the hybrid stuff um, stays. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Um, I wonder, because if some of this becomes the new normal, some people might want to stick to it, but people might want to just get back to it the way things were, it's, um, habit is good, but unfortunately kind of mindless habit is not. Um, and people don't always learn lesson, the proper lesson from something just like with the COVID thing. One lesson people should be learning is the importance of being healthy. Whoa. It's like all this stuff going on with COVID. I need to like dial in my sleep, make sure I'm eating right. Um, exercise, get good social time, learn more about, I need to like start learning about human biology and what it, what it is to be healthy and see if what we've been told is right or wrong. Just like, um, I need to like look at Martin Luther King as he says to think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We're prone to let our mental life become invaded by legions of half truths, prejudices and propaganda, unquote. If people would ask, well, where am I thinking for myself and where do I know the facts in health, diet, all that, COVID, the, the virus and the vaccine versus what is prejudice and propaganda? If they do that, there'd be more changes. But are a lot of people really, and I don't think we're going to see at the end of this, unfortunately, I wish it were different, but I don't think we're going to see a lot of people changing fundamentally how they eat getting more exercise, getting outdoors, ma making all these other changes. I think too, too many people are going to are staying the same and are not changing and are just going to fall back into that. Well, we did all learn the value of having reserved toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe our emergency preparedness skills have been uh, honed a bit. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, hopefully it's emergency preparedness, not just paranoia. But yeah, sure. it was funny how the paper towels and the wipes and the toilet paper were all empty for a long time. 
Yeah, that was interesting. But I think some stuff good will come out of it. People doing some gardening, which gets them outside, helps them make their own food. It's good for vegetables. Um, meat, I think, nutrition quality stays longer. You can, like, get it and send it to the other side of the world. But vegetables, they decay really fast. I think we need local for that um, to get good nutrient quality. Um, to get the vitamins and minerals and nutrients we need from vegetables, a lot of them need to be um, fresh. So people garden, it's better. Like I think, I read this book, um, Eating on the Wild Side by Joe Robinson. Um, Listen to it on Audible. And she talked about a lot of interesting things in there. Like I think um, asparagus loses half its nutrient value in like a day. Um, kale, I don't remember what percentage, but it loses a lot of its nutrients in like two or three days. It must lose all its flavor too in that time. <laughs> you don't like it. <laughs> uh, I have eaten one dish that I cooked with kale and it was decent, but um, <laughs> it was, I don't put it at the, at the top of my vegetable list. Yeah. Um, I don't remember about spinach, some of these others, but um, and some are better with canning. I think some nutrients in tomatoes don't become bioavailable to us until they're cooked. So some cooked and canned tomatoes can be more nutritious than some fresh. And of course, by bioavailable, I mean, people can do a chemistry experiment and see that there's a certain amount of some nutrient, some chemical in a vegetable, but that doesn't mean we can absorb it. That's what I mean by bioavailable. How much is there in a chemistry experiment versus, versus how much of that nutrient we can break down and absorb and use. That's a totally different question. So someone might say, well, this vegetable is better than that meat because there's all these nutrients in it. No. They're not bioavailable. It's not a matter of what's in there chemically. It can be found through a chemistry experiment, but what can a human body absorb? That's the relevant question. Um, so yeah, some gardening, getting outside. And I talked to someone who, at a park, I was walking a trail, stopped, and sometimes some people talk to you. Um, probably they talk to more you than me because I'm out there barefoot and shirtless and some people think I'm crazy. Sometimes I got this trash bag full of trash on my shoulder because I've cleaned up. <laughs> and some people are out there. They probably, they literally, they walk by and you can tell they don't want to look at me. They probably think I'm some like homeless crazy guy. <laughs> All my belongings on my back. They're going to call 911. They do. The police have actually told me. They've told me that because I know some of them, like local park people and police because I pick up trash in the area. They know me. They know the barefoot shirtless guy who picks up trash. But some cop told me. That people, sometimes they get calls about me. <laughs> There's a barefoot shirtless guy out running around. <laughs> but it's like, how pathetic. Like, people don't even know, like, the, the, the sight of someone picking up trash. They're not even like, that's outside their scope. It's like, what the hell? Or seeing someone barefoot and shirtless like a normal human being to soak up the vitamin D and everything. And so my shirt doesn't get all sweaty. It's like, what the heck is going on with this culture? Some aspects are great, but some people are just, like, wonky. Or, like, I'm going to start saying to some people, um, since some people need, like, a little verbal slap to kind of wake them up, I'd rather not. I try to reason with people and, like, explain things to them, and that's what I do mostly. And then, but sometimes still, some people call you crazy. You're barefoot. You're crazy. Yeah, like your grandparents and your great-grandparents and your ancestors. Crazy like them. Right. Um, like everybody that made you. Yeah. Uh-huh. But, um, but this lady at the park actually stopped and talked instead of went all wacko. Um, this is like last year, summer, fall, I forget. But she was saying how she had been out walking at the park and it's something she hadn't done as much before. Um, She'd bring her daughter out 
sometimes. She was alone this time. But she'd get out, get some exercise, so they're doing something instead of being caught inside. And one day she said she noticed, it's like, whoa, I'm like a different person since I've been outdoors. This is like helping me so much. My like my health and my psychological well-being, I feel so much better. Um, so hopefully she can have her life dialed in so she can continue that. Hopefully things don't get busy and she's not able to do it though she wants to. But at least she's seen the value of um, being out in the wild, fresh air and all that. Um, hopefully more people do that. But yes. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we all maybe carry uh, forward these new exercise habits. Yeah, but yeah, I think um, be nice to people, learn more. But human history shows people don't. Um, some do, not enough do. But it'll be interesting to see what comes out of this COVID thing. Um, how people change, how people improve. But then, of course, um, there'll be some less than reasonable things coming out of it, too. Some people taking advantage of the situation. Government control or whatever. Um, but Any last words, Scott? Uh, those are the last words. <laughs> the last words are the last words. <laughs> cool. And what'd you say your summary of this was? I'm a little brain dead and I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> well, we just talked about um, physically adapting, right, from exercise to nutrition, et cetera, to the different times under COVID, um, how learning has changed what will be carried forward with all of those things as we eventually move into uh, a world without COVID. Mm -hmm. Cool. Hopefully sooner the better. But kind of to review, as Martin Luther King said, in all things, quote, education must also train one for quick, resolute, and effective thinking. To think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We are prone to let our mental life become invaded by legions of half-truths, prejudices, and propaganda. At this point, I often wonder whether or not education is fulfilling its purpose. A great majority of the so-called educated people do not think logically and scientifically. Even the press, the classroom, the platform, and the pulpit, in many instances, do not give us objective and unbiased truths. To save man from the morass of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence, to discern the true from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction." Unquote. Hopefully we were true to that today. Think so, Scott? Think so. <laughs> Hopefully we help people see a little bit more about that, gave them some ideas they wouldn't think of, might not have thought of, because no one's omniscient. We all have different fields we don't know about that would help to learn from other people, but um, we should think independently. It helps us. That way we can better help our friends and our family and the culture, those we care about. Um, otherwise, when we see things like the Lysenko thing and some of the group think gone wrong as we see in human history we're social animals we're going to do group think we have conventions we want to belong that's just the way we are but thankfully we're self-sovereign social animals we're not like ants so we can know what's true think conceptually and that is what's going to help us help ourselves help our friends help our family help the culture agree scott or disagree I agree. Is that a good thesis? Can we write an essay on it? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, and then next time we can talk a little bit about some other cultural events, cultural trends going on in education, um, where that's leading, where that came from, where that might lead to in the future. But, uh, cool. 
All right. Look forward to it. Awesome. Maybe I can go to breakfast now. It's like 4, 4 p.m. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. So, hope you enjoyed that, folks. Um, and we will be talking with you soon. Thanks, and stay healthy. And stay rational. <laughs>